Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, while everyone was excited last weekend for the successful launch of the Electron rocket to orbit, it turns out that Rocket Lab had a couple of surprises up their sleeve. Today, they revealed the identity of a fourth payload, the Humanity Star, which basically looks like a big disco ball in space. And uh, yeah, in their own words, it's designed to encourage everyone to look up and consider our place in the universe. And if you like disco in space, I do have a playlist of some amazing space disco tunes to uh, let you appreciate our place in space. They even have a nice little website that will show you when it will fly over. I don't think I'm going to see it for about 100 days, but when it does, I'll be sure to look up and watch it twinkling in the sky. But anyway, the really interesting announcement was that the revelation that they had also successfully tested a third stage for their Electron rocket. This was designed to put payloads into exactly the right orbit, or to boost them higher up. It also used a smaller rocket engine called Curie. But the most interesting part of this revelation was that it used a green monopropellant. Now, of course, when I say green, I'm not talking about the colour of the fuel. I'm referring to the fuel being less hazardous than the fuel that is generally used for such things. Hydrazine. In this case, it's a lot less to do with protecting the environment as it is to do with making it easier for ground crews working with the satellite who have to get dressed up in protective gear with self-contained oxygen supplies. I mean, apparently it can cost over $100,000 just for the fueling process for a small satellite. The truth is that hydrazine is a horrific substance to work with. I mean, it's a rocket fuel, so of course it has lots of energy in it, but it's also corrosive, carcinogenic, and straight up toxic to humans. It will, in tiny quantities, it will attack the nervous system, the liver, and probably all sorts of other essential organs. So unsurprisingly, getting a fuel which is greener than hydrazine is actually pretty easy. Monopropellant thrusters use a single fuel, which can be decomposed to release exhaust gases and heat. Typically, this means passing it over a catalyst bed with a, made of something like iridium or platinum. And uh, in the case of hydrazine, this will decompose into hydrogen, nitrogen, ammonia, and the exhaust gases will be as hot as 1000 degrees centigrade. The nice thing about monopropellants is that since there's only one fuel, you basically can control them by flipping one valve open and closed. So it gives you a lot of advantages in terms of simplicity. On the other hand, monopropellant performances tend to be significantly lower than bipropellants. For example, hydrazine has performance of about 220 seconds of specific impulse, whereas when you use something like monomethyl hydrazine, uh, and dinitrogen tetroxide on the space shuttle, that got you 330 seconds. That's a 50% boost just by switching over to a bipropellant. Now, some people would argue that hydrogen peroxide could be considered a green fuel because its exhaust products are water and oxygen, two substances that the human body works just fine with. It's also well understood with a long history of use in the space programs, but hydrogen peroxide still is nasty stuff to handle. It'll happily corrode all sorts of things, and truthfully, its performance is pretty lousy. Similarly, cold gas reaction control thrusters can be used. These are actually used on Falcon 9 to uh, control the first stage during its flip over before landing. And of course, cold gas thrusters are great. You know, it's just compressed gas, which is completely inert. The exhaust is completely inert. There's actually uh, some footage of Elon Musk and Steve Jurvetson kind of walking around the wreckage of the grasshopper, which had exploded minutes earlier. Uh, it's still smoking. And I'm going to say that's fine with cold gas thrusters. I would not do it if there had been hydrazine anywhere on that thing. A more modern green fuel that's already been tested on a Swedish spacecraft called Prisma is codenamed LMP-103S. It's mostly made of ammonium dinitroamide and it's dissolved in a mixture of water, methanol and ammonia to balance out the combustion products and to stabilize its explosive tendencies. When you try to put that many nitrogen atoms in a single molecule, you just know that there's a lot of energy just wanting to get out. 
So not only is it safer and easier to handle, it actually gets superior performance, about 6% better specific impulse over hydrazine, and when you consider its higher density, it gets about 30% better impulse overall if you just swapped out a hydrazine system with the LMP103S. And that's even before you start considering the savings from being able to cut down on safety features which are less essential now that the propellant isn't going to poison people once it leaks. So why isn't every spacecraft already switching over to this? Well, aerospace is a notoriously risk-averse industry, and changing an existing working design is understandably met with resistance. When you can't service your spacecraft on orbit, it's easy to justify using the fuel which has worked on hundreds of missions previously. Anyway, on this side of the Atlantic, the US has been developing its own green monoprop in the guise of AFM-315E, developed by the Air Force Research Lab. This is based about around something called hydroxyl ammonium nitrate. On its own, this molecule comes with lots of energy and a tendency to decompose when you look at it the wrong way. But over the last couple of decades, the Air Force scientists have come up with the exact combination of fuels, solvents and stabilizers so they could put HAN in and get out a good monopropellant. On paper, it's superior to LMP-103S with a specific impulse of 257 seconds and a density 45% higher than hydrazine. However, it's yet to be flown on any test flight in space, but we hope that we will see this happen soon. The Green Propellant Infusion Mission is a NASA mission which is going to ideally be flown on the second launch of the Falcon Heavy as part of the space test program. It'll ride along with a bunch of other experimental satellites and uh, hopefully we'll get to see that later this year. After all, we just had the Falcon Heavy perform a full test burn of all 27 engines this morning, so I'm getting excited. The GPIM literature also mentions other advantages of this fuel mix. It can be safely allowed to freeze in the tanks and later thawed out when it's needed, whereas hydrazine systems are supposed to be kept heated to avoid potential damage due to pipe, uh, and pipes due to expansion and contraction. Uh, the propellant is also less prone to leakage due to higher viscosity and the thrusters can't accidentally fire because it won't decompose unless the catalyst beds are heated before, uh, before firing, which does add a little bit of complexity to the design, but overall it's considered a safety improvement. However, the exact fuel used by Lock Rocket Lab and the Curie engine is still a secret as of now, and there are plenty of other possibilities. But there is a patent for an engine using something called a viscous monoprop, which was awarded to Rocket Lab. And it describes a different type of fuel from the two that I've been talking about. Perhaps this is what they've developed into their Curie engine? At this time, we can't really know, and we'll be paying attention regardless. So yeah, green monopropellants aren't just a nod to the environment, they are actually better propellants overall, and that's real rocket science. So we hope to find out what happens and we hope to see some future launches with this technology. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.